So, as I say, I'm Tamsin, I run Hope and Word of Warning, and you're going to hear a lot from me first. And then after a short break, we'll hear experiences of successful DYCP applications from Tanya Kamara, Megan Griffith, and Kelly Munro Fawcett. And at the end, we should have 25 minutes or so for questions. I'm going to try, I'm going to be trying to coordinate this with Davinia Jockey from home and John Franklin Johnston, who works with me. As I said before, put your questions in the chat, prefaced with question in uppercase. Maybe hold off until later in case they get answered in the meantime. I've been around a long time and done a lot of project applications, but I've also helped a lot of artists with DYCP. I'm absolutely not part of ACE. I've no particular extra information, though I do have quite a lot of chats with relationship managers, but just know everything I say is my opinion and don't be surprised if I can't answer. I'll start with what this isn't. It's not an ACE style talk through with slides, nor is it an introduction to Grantium. I'm making the assumption that you can all read the guidance and watch the Grantium videos for yourselves, and we'll put links to them in the chat. If anybody doesn't know what I'm talking about with Grantium, Grantium that's the Arts Council's funding portal, and if you're new to it, do watch their videos. It's very special. Um, what I am going to do is outline the Developing Your Creative Practice DYCP scheme, the differences between it and project grants or NLPG, and what I think is a sensible approach. As I say, I'm starting from the assumption you have a certain level of familiarity with the grant system and with Grantium. I'm not going through every section of the Form Arts Council style. A lot is pretty self-explanatory. The main focus will be on what I see as the meat of the application, the three main questions, and then we'll skip through the other questions flag flagging anything significant. First, a bit of a recap and general overview about applying to ACE. The guiding principle with everything, do your homework and be really planned. Arguably, DYCP is more about planning your programme of activity than writing the application itself. Don't think that you can just rock up in Grantium or even in an offline template and just start writing. And while we can talk you through guidelines, it's no substitute for really studying them and the FAQs, the case studies, and any specific art form information. Personally, when I'm writing an application, I start from the budget. It serves as a kind of roadmap or checklist of all the things needed and all the things that I'm, I'm saying are going to happen. If you're not experienced with budgets, think of them as a shopping list. List all the things you need to make the project happen, cost them out, then figure out how you ensure you have enough to pay for them. When you do start writing, start work in bullet points, but never use an actual bullet point in Grantium, use a dash. If you write in bullets, you can easily pick them up and move them around, which you can't do with longhand prose. And in terms of answering the right question in the right place, that's quite critical. Then by all means expand to longhand, but starting with bullets will save you ripping the heart and soul out of the application because of the horrible character counts. As with any application, think of your audience, not so much the end audience here, <clears throat> but the immediate reader. In this case, the RMs who are going to be reading it. They may not be from your art form. They will have loads to look at and very little time and they'll have to make some very difficult choices. So make it easy, clear and simple. If it has to be read several times to be got, then it's unlikely to be successful. Make it distinctive and make it punchy. And just remind us about Grantium. Make sure you have a validated Grantium applicant profile before the scheme opens. Never write straight into Grantium. You risk losing the work. Use an offline word processing template, e.g. the version we're going to drop into the chat, chat, the one without the notes. Grantium counts characters, including spaces, but its counting is not the same as word. 
It also does not tell you how many characters you've used, just that you've used too many when you try to save it, but usefully not how many too many. Use an online character counting, e.g. countingcharacters.com. That's a more accurate gauge of what Grantium sees as characters. With DYCP, limits are less tight than in NLPG. Uh, John's going to drop into the chat what in two messages, what 1500 characters, which is the average you're going to be writing, looks like. So the process is work in word processing, copy and paste into countingcharacters.com, and then copy and paste into Grantium. Believe me, it will save you time. Once in Grantium, save as you go along. Typing within Grantium does not count as activity, so you can get timed out. Build your application with bullet points, but once in Grantium, use a dash or use a pointy bracket or something. An actual special character, like a bullet point in Word, uses about 20 characters in Grantium so, and comes out as gobbledygook, though you won't immediately see it. So just don't use special characters. And by the way, you can't bold or anything else. The only thing you can do to make things stand out is capitals. Write in plain English. Imagine you're explaining this to your grandma or to a postman. Don't use art form specific language. The assessor may not know anything about your art form. Get someone you know, not necessarily an arts professional, to read a draft fresh and to tell you what doesn't make sense or needs clarifying. But then don't explain it to them. Rewrite it until they understand. Moving on more specifically to DYCP. Those of you who've heard my lengthy polemic on NLPG, available on YouTube, may either be disappointed or re relieved to know that DYCP is quite a lot less mysterious and rather simpler to understand. Also unusually, ACE's guidance is really rather good. With, and it has a lot of case studies of successful projects. So I'd really recommend you read it. D the OICP is also the one area that is free from the cold dead hand of let's create. But of course, when I say rather good and free from let's create, it's not entirely true. The question and character counts document on the ACE site dates from April 2018. ACE inquiries maintain that, sorry, ACE inquiries maintain that they haven't changed DYCP since 2018, but they actually have. And although I did point this out to them and give them a correct version over a month ago, they've done nothing to update it. Um, which is just a bit critical as you can't see the form itself in Grantium until the scheme reopens on September the 6th. Luckily, I always keep an open application so I can see it. And I've painstakingly downloaded all the questions and the notes into a Word document, which we'll put into the chat. So you too can see what the questions all are. I'll come on to the specifics of the differences since 2018 later, but it might be useful for you to be forewarned. Otherwise, they might be a bit of a nasty shock when you're up against a, a deadline in Grantium. So back to the beginning. Developing your creative practice supports individuals who are cultural and creative practitioners, which is what they call artists now, and want to take time to focus on their creative development. It is only open to individuals or collaborations. Organisations cannot apply. To quote Arts Council, this programme will give individuals the opportunity to apply for two to £10,000 to take a dedicated period of time to focus on their own cultural and creative development and take them to the next stage in their practice. For applicants with personal access costs, you can also include these on top of the £10,000 maximum. We would like to see applications for development activities from practitioners working in any of our supported disciplines. To be eligible for this programme, your application must identify a clear development opportunity. This could be for a period of research, time to create new work, 
travel, including international working, training, developing future ideas, networking or mentoring. DYCP encourages development by enabling people to innovate and take creative risks, work in new ways and to eventually reach new audiences. That word eventually is important. It is unusual for an ACE scheme. Unlike NLPG, it has deadlines, four per year. And from opening the call to the deadline is really quite rapid, normally about four weeks. And it takes about 10 weeks for the results to come out. The next round, which is round 15, opens on the 6th of September. So I'm guessing the deadline will be 4th of October and I'm guessing the results will be the 13th of December, but these haven't been published. So those are just my best guess. The application itself is a hell of a lot shorter and more straightforward than NLPG. It requires no outcome. It requires no immediate public benefit and it requires no match funding. But you must have an example of your work via a web link or an attachment and critically one supporting document written by someone other than you that supports the quality of your practice. This can be a review, external views of your work or a letter of support from an organisation or partner you've worked with. And DYCP is extremely competitive. And they say applicants must show a clear development plan to be eligible. Strong applicant, applicants are those that can demonstrate a real impact on people's cultural and creative development in England. So eligibility in general. Anyone who applies to developing your creative practice needs to be working in one of the supported art forms, which are music, theatre, dance, visual arts, literature, libraries, combined arts, museums practice. You have to apply as an individual or as a small group of practitioners who usually collaborate in their work. Organisations cannot apply, individuals, individuals cannot apply on behalf of an organisation. You must be based within, or i.e. live in England, have a UK bank account in the exact name you're applying in. And if you're applying as a group of practitioners, one person should submit the application, take the lead on managing the grant and should provide their bank details. You must be at least 18 years old and have critically one year's creative practice experience outside a formal education context. They also impose some additional eligibility criteria for each round. For round 14, the last one, they were if you have made two unsuccessful or one successful application since 9th of October 2019, you weren't eligible. They haven't published the specific rules for round 15 yet, but I guess you probably want to update that date by three months, but I'm guessing. Also, please read their guidance for what make th makes things ineligible, particularly if you're working in film video and audio where the definitions are all quite big technicalities. Looking at NLPG project grants versus DYCP. This is the table that Arts Council offers up to show the difference between the two. As I say, DYCP is open to individuals, NLPG to organisations and individuals. It's DYCP is more for early to midpoint, um, NLPG is wider. Critically, DYCP, the immediate beneficiary is you. Um, and people will be able to engage with your work at a later date as a result. Whereas with NLPG, the main, it's mainly about public benefits. The YCP is two to ten thousand pounds, and LPG is one to a hundred thousand. For DYCP, it's for activities up to one year. For projects, you can be up to three years. DYCP has four deadlines, 
and LPG, you can apply at any time. DYCP decisions take 10 weeks and LPG take eight weeks for under 30s, 12 weeks for over. And then there are some other restrictions around um, DYCP, which they haven't published this. I personally would kind of shortcut this when, when I'm looking at the difference between them. If it looks like a project, it probably is a project. If in your head, you think of it as a project, it's probably a project. If it has an end outcome, like a show or a script, or if you're thinking about an audience, it's probably a project. Pri prior to November 2021, if it could feasibly be a project, it was generally better to go for an LPG. You could ask for more money, the turnaround was quicker, and it was marginally less competitive. Now it's a much, much closer call given the longer time frame and the really onerous new NLPG form. But you've got to be pretty convincing if you want to make what's really a project look like a DYCP. DYCP is essentially about you. There's no need for public benefit or outcomes. Things that are projects with a bit of other stuff tacked on for development don't tend to be very successful. They're looking for really well thought through structured developmental courses. As a rule of thought, thumb, if the driving force is to get a project up and running, it's not DYCP. If the driving force is to move you to a different place, then it is. It gets trickier because there is an even finer line between DYCP and project R&D. And now with just how burdensome an LPG is, I can see the temptation to, to push your R&D into, into DYCP, but you know, make it handle with care, make a very good case if you're going to do it. It's much easier to draw the lines between DYCP and NLPG with specific examples. So we can have a go at doing that a bit in the Q&A at the end. But in the meantime, here are a few examples from an earlier session we did. So the first one, I'm developing 3D prints as part of an accessible touring project to be experienced by touch and audio description displayed alongside the rest of the artwork. Now for me, this is obviously a project. It's all about the outcome and the product. A series of workshops for writers and poets, plus a residency and a film showcase. Consideration of access and inclusion throughout. Two facilitators, 12 to 15 participants, prioritization of global majority and disabled people. Again, to me, I think that's a project. It demonstrates just how entrenched the project mentality and the public benefit thinking is in us all when we start considering work. It's really all about focusing on other people and their benefit, which is perfect for projects. To develop artwork, producing a range of fine art paintings and photocopyable study sheets for schools. I already have confirmation that XXX Gallery will host my solo show. I think it will be better for me to apply for the process grant as this is likely to be a lifelong project and I'm only at the very beginning. Again, for me, this is a project. Just because it's part of lifelong practice, it doesn't really demonstrate DYCP. It's all about the outcomes, not about the process of developing the artist or making a change in their practice. I would use five days of research space to explore my own embodied practice to discover autobiographical stories and create a scripted thematic. I would then invite participants into the project and facilitate their practice using the scripts as the public engagement component of the project. This one's interesting. It starts out looking exactly like a possible DYCP, exploring the artist's practice. Though obviously they need to be more detailed and more explicit about the kind of changes it was making. But then it turns itself around to, to again talk about public engagement. So it starts to sort of sidetrack itself into being a project again. So this is one's absolutely borderline. And I'd, if I was advising them, I'd advise to go for the first part only. A published poet and playwright wanting a major change in career to pivot towards prose and novels. They will research and write the first 10 chapters of a novel within DYCP. 
This is the one that I think could clear cut be DYCP. It's showing development. And while it talks about outcomes in terms of chapters, that's about putting to practice what's being explored. Within the sense, it doesn't describe how they'll be going about that development, so that obviously that will be an area to focus on. But to demonstrate just how permeable this boundary is, this could also go in as a project R&D if they were putting their focus more on the chapters and on, say, getting a publisher interested in, in them for a future public outcome. So I say it is quite permeable. In terms of what makes successful DYCP, I'd again refer you to the case studies and, of course, to the three artists who are going to talk to you when I shut up. So what are they looking for in DYCP programmes? When DYCP started, it was very much about making a step change in practice. It was kind of aimed at more established practitioners and they were looking to see significant development or a marked step change. The things that initially were successful were, for instance, an established theatre and education director looking to move to mainstream theatre or a playwright looking to write their first novel. Since it reopened post lockdown, it's been wider in its reach. It's been embracing the more emergent and probably a much wider range of practitioners who started to engage with Arts Council through the emergency funds. But thinking about what the change in your practice that you're looking to make is still the best starting point. And especially if you're going to be able to make an argument that it makes you produce better art or crucially makes you more economically sustainable. And if you can show future public benefit. Their key question is why this? Why now? And keep those two things in mind. They're looking for well-researched, well-structured programmes of up to 12 months that you can demonstrate the benefits of at each step. I always say, think of it like writing your own university course. Keep it simple and stick to your original rationale. Don't be tempted to cram in loads of offshoot things that overcomplicate it and make it look unrealistic. You want to be ambitious, but you don't want to be unrealistic. As with everything, really do your homework well in advance. Putting to together your programme is not a quick business. Research any travel, research any short courses, line up any mentors so you can name them. You can include international travel and course fees, but not formal higher education. You should be paying yourself a reasonable amount. You can include necessary equipment, but this is not the buy me a MacBook fund. Keep it to no more than maybe 10% of your application. The artists speaking after me will fill you in on how they approach putting together their programmes, but again, look at the case studies as well. Looking in more detail at the application itself, its meat is really very simple. There are three main questions. Question one, Arts Council never numbered their questions, by the way, and it's really annoying. Question one, please tell us about yourself and your creative practice, which is 1800 characters. Question two, tell us about the developmental opportunity you want to undertake, what you hope to get out of it, and how you will go about it. And that's 1500 characters. Question three, why is this important for your practice at this point? And how will this create, help create future opportunities? That's 1500 characters. Within the application notes, they give decent pointers as to what to cover in each question. So I'm not going through those in detail. But there's an overarching way of approaching it. I like to think of this as your X factor journey. Question one is the, where are you now? Question two is the, what journey you're going on? Question three is what's the destination and why this, why now? 
So for question one, you want to paint a picture of your current relevant career position. You want to show why you're a good investment and the potential you have. But be careful, don't oversell yourself. Leave room for that journey. Steer away from any significant experience in the field you are looking to develop. If you're too good now, why would they fund you to develop in it? In true X Factor fashion, if there's a little pathos you could build in, especially around social socioeconomic position, then go for it here. For question two, outline the journey, the overarching area of development and each activity you're looking to undertake and an analysis of why you've chosen that activity. But don't put in real specifics here dates, places, etc., or too much detail. That can all go in the later activity plan. Focus on the rationale for, the, for what you're tackling and the rationale for each chosen activity. And then question three is where will this take your career at the end of the program? Why you will be, for instance, more economically sustainable? and how this is going to benefit both the quality of your practice and the future public benefits. So that's the meat of the application, and that's really that simple. Where are you now? What is the journey you're going on? And what is the destination? And why this? Why now? But looking to the rest of the form, as I say, I'm, I'm going to put it up. You've got it, don't make too many notes because you've got all this in the documents in the chat. Um, and I'm going to skip through some of it um, fairly fast because there are a lot of notes here. The activity dates, as ever, they're going to want your activity start date, their activity end date. And remember, you have up to a year to do this. And then how did you hear about this is for their marketing purposes. Activity focus. These are a series of um, tick boxes for your area of focus. So again, they're quite good hints as to what you could be applying for. Building new networks, creating new work, experiment with new collaborators, international travel to explore other practice or work with mentors, professional development activities, research and development time to explore practice and take risks. I think the creating new work one is tricky because you could you could easily um, be pushing yourself into project territory. But if it's R&D around new work and, that, and it includes you putting into practice what you're learning, then, then that's fine. The next is the first of the, those questions, the, the where are you now question. And again, you've got 1800 characters and those are decent pointers to write to, to so that you know what to cover in these points. The focus, your main normal focus, your achievements, any commissions, important bits of work, anyone of note that you've worked with, um, anything else, um, whether you've shown that you're ready to benefit from a development opportunity. So you're needing to show some track record there. This is question two, the opportunity you want to, uh, to undertake, what you'll get out of it and how you'll go about it. So this is the journey. So how you'll seek out those opportunities, how ambitious it is. Ambition's a big thing with them. They want to see ambition, they just want it to be realistic. Um, but that, and it tends to be the more extended periods that which are more successful. They also want here to show that it's that you can manage it and whether it's realistic and well platformed. Think that your own university course. And if you have plans to access the networks you want to work with. Um, and then question three, why is this important for your practice at this point and how this will help create new opportunities? Again, this is the, this is the way you, your destination is, the why this, why now? The main aims, why, the why now, where you think it's gonna take you in the future, 
what will be different? And again, here, I would throw in future public benefits. And I'll explain why in a second. So this is actually where I'll explain it. Public engagement. This is one of the areas that isn't on the 2018 document that they give you to download. Slightly farcical, given this is a project that needs no outcome and no public engagement. Um, but I have been telling artists for some while that the smart, pl smart play is to talk about how this will increase future public benefit. And so now they're making it quite enshrined and quite explicit that they want you to demonstrate this. Here, it's only tick boxes. That's all you have to do. But I would strongly put some level of explanation or expansion of that in your the previous question, the question three. So yes, you could be, the, the future benefits could be making you work to show to the public, reaching new audiences, developing networks, et cetera. Then the joy of our outcomes. This is another one not in their document. Um, and this is where I said that if you know it's not entirely, let's create free. For anyone who's been hiding under a rather comfy rock, let's create is Arts Council's new 10 year strategy. Um, we'll drop the link in the chat for, for how you can read up on it. But it has three outcomes creative people, everyone can develop and express creativity cultural communities, villages, towns and cities thrive through a collaborative approach to culture, and a creative and cultural country. England's cultural sector is innovative, collaborative and international. So people. People is largely about participation and individual creative creativity up to the point of a professional career, i.e. before a professional career. For the path purposes of Let's Create, artists are not creative people. So your own development would not be responding to creative people. Whereas if you were training yourself, say in say music therapy or skills in developing participatory theater, that could be contributing to creative people in the future. Communities is a bit unclear. In, in writing, they focus on very hard on geographic communities. And it seems to really be pointing towards things like libraries as arts hubs. But it might include communities of interest and practice. Try as I might, I can't get them to clarify this one. Um, and I've been trying for about 18 months. I'd say, say if your DYCP was researching, creating a community arts hub, for instance, then that would be then contributing to, to cultural communities. Creative and cultural country. This basically encompasses professional activity, including artist development. So if you're developing your own creative practice and the out end outcome will be making professional work, then it's probably contributing to country. So, and, and their reporting shows that actually it is making the biggest impact in terms of contributing to creative and cultural country. I won't go into more depth about these here. You only have to, again, tick box select them. But again, if you watch our YouTube video on NLPG, I explain more. And if you download the spreadsheet that goes along with it, there's a tab that lists, lists each outcome and what they call elements within it and those elements might guide you to, to in making up your mind which which outcomes you're you're going for then there's the attach the attachment about your work and it can either be a web link or an or a document i'm not going to read all this out but if you're going to do a web link don't just give them your home page i would create a page specifically for this Put any all the examples of work you want them to look at on that, be it video, be it audio, be it written, be it images, and then give them the link to that page. They only have to look at one link. 
Similarly, it's got to be a maximum of five pages. So be careful and be very picky with what you put in. Then there's the supporting document. Don't leave this to the last, last minute and try and bums rush somebody into writing you a reference at short notice. It's really annoying. Um, not that I speak from any experience at all. Um, it has to be written by someone other than you and demonstrate the quality of your practice. Now, while you can use reviews, probably the most impactful will be a, a, a reference from somebody, preferably quite high profile, who knows your work and has seen you working or has worked with you. What you want from this is somebody to say all the nice things that you're too embarrassed to say about yourself. So it's, it is really important to get that badge. And as I say, if it's somebody, particularly if it's the director of a high level MPO, et cetera, that's the, probably the best you're going to get. Moving on to the budget. Again, you don't need any match funding. So you're only going to be looking at expenditure. Um, I'm not going to go these through these in a lot of detail because they're long and they're quite self-explanatory. But you can include fees for your own time. You need to break down your costs and you need to show that they're appropriate. They're going to ask you for the full amount you're, you're requesting and then how much is for personal access costs. That will actually come through from your original eligibility form and will appear automatically. And if you need to edit it, you need to go back, I think. But um, and then do you object to receive, receiving national lottery funding for religious reasons? Because by and large, DYCP is, is, is lottery money. They then ask you to break down your spending and show out how you worked out your figures. So X number of days at Y rate for however many people, et cetera. Um, artistic and creative is likely to be the largest part of your budget. It, could, it should include fees for yourself and for any artists and creatives, e.g. mentors, et cetera, involved in it. They want to see people are properly paid. So wherever possible, I would use a, rele a relevant union rate or a good explanation why you're using a different rate if you are. Um, and then other artistic or creative costs, um, materials that you might use. It gets very confusing here because they talk about materials or equipment, but then they have a separate section for it. So I think you can kind of take your pick. Then there's overheads, so only those directly related. So you can't, unless, you know, unless you're using an entire building for just this one project for a year, you couldn't put an entire year's rent of a building in there, but you could put a proportion. You can put phone bills, you can put posts, you can put insurance, all those sorts of basic costs. Then there's this assets, materials, equipment, and instruments. As I say, it's a bit confusing because I'd normally put equipment and, and materials in artistic costs, but you can put them here. If you put them here though, they might ask you later for three different quotes. And as I say, I would keep it down to just the essentials for what you need for this specific activity. Uh, the reason I poke fun at the Buy Me a MacBook Fund is that I know that, it, it, that towards the end of 2020, almost every application that came in was asking for a MacBook. Um, and then other spending, anything else that crops up, particularly I would put a contingency, a what if fund at maybe 5% in there. And then your personal access costs. If you need, if you have a disability or are neurodiverse, um, there may be extra costs and you can put these in. The, the, the ones you put in this budget should only be for the support you need while carrying out the DYCP program. That's post application costs. If you need help and support writing the application, you do that before you put in the application by contacting Arts Council inquiries. And there's a whole process um, involved in that. Read this one carefully if you think it might be applicable to you. The activity plan 
then is very similar to an NLPG activity plan. This is where you put the detail of your program, the dates, the timeframes, the locations, the specifics. And if you can frame them in some way to have some sort of smart objective, so that's simple, measurable, achievable, realistic, targeted, then, then so much the better. Um, and I think some of the artists are going to talk about their timelines, but it's very much do it in chronological order. It will save you a lot of gr grief later. So um, do it from start to finish, because if you jump around, you may confuse yourself later because Grantium reorders things. Um, so, yeah, this is where you put exact time. Time It is tedious to do, as is the budget. So strike a healthy balance between what's enough detail and what's going to break your heart when you're trying to input it in Grantium. Um, and then this final question, helping us to evaluate the programme. This is not compulsory. This is for their monitoring. You can choose not to answer it, but it's basically asking you of your total income in the past 12 months, and what percentage of that income would you estimate came from your practice? As I say, not compulsory, up to you. And then that's it for the form. So just as final words before we take a break, think, write your own university course, be planned, structured and analytical. Why this, why now? Think, where are you now? What's your, your journey? What's your destination? And don't forget to get your supporting document written by someone else in advance. Don't leave inputting to Grantium to the last minute. It has a nasty tendency to crash on deadlines. Do it several days in advance and leave a lot of time, especially for the budget and activity plan, as they're tedious. They're line by line inputs. So that's my high speed take on it. As I say, as a form, it's much more straightforward. I would say the real art and the real work is in planning the right DYCP programme for yourself and then describing it well. So let's pause for 10 minutes. During the break, you can drop your questions into the chat preceded by question. After the break, Tanya Kamara, Megan Griffith and Kelly Munro Fawcett are going to talk about their experiences of working on a successful bid. And then we'll have questions. So I'll see you at one. Thanks. So um, I'm just kind of discuss. I'm just kind of. Uh, I will discuss how I approached it. How I approached my application. Um, so um, I'm a performance artist, and I was kind of delving deep into uh, African dance and theatre at the time before I applied for DYCP. So I was just looking at those main uh, art forms. And then after we went into lockdown, I really wanted to explore music in my work um, and uh, poetry as well, because I'm coming from, I use a tradition that's called Batufu and it uses all of these uh, art forms in one. So I really wanted to create a framework, but also like an interdisciplinary um, a practice which I then make work from. So I kind of had that in mind already when I thought about applying for, for DYCP. So the way I approached it was, I started looking at what skills I needed uh, to acquire in order to create that practice, basically. 
and what I was already what I was lacking in was knowledge in music uh like I was already learning to play piano but I wasn't doing anything with that um so I wanted to know like how can I incorporate what I was already learning into my practice and so I decided to apply for the DYCP so the things that I really focused on was um music writing creative writing but also poetry because I think poetry has a, mus a musicality about it so those were the things that I really specified in my application but when I was looking doing the research uh, in terms of who I wanted to mentor me who I wanted to learn from what I wanted to learn I was looking at people that had those skills already so I um, spoke to my piano teacher at the time because I also know that he composes and so I asked him whether he would be willing to um, teach me how to start composing my own my own music as well. So that was he was one of my mentors. And then I also decided that I wanted to learn how to create like soundscape and music through uh, the use of a loop pedal. And so I, I knew an artist that was already working with that and was already uh, working within the theatre, within theatre and um, performance so I knew that she would know how to kind of integrate what I'm trying to do with what I already know uh, and that artist was Tisha Thompson so I spoke to her and I said can I have uh, can you be one of my mentors uh, and she agreed so I already had in mind what I wanted to learn um, and then I went and looked for the people that I wanted to learn it from and then once they had agreed uh, I designed a one-year uh, program that incorporated the things I wanted to learn from them. So one of one of the ways to do this is to speak to them and kind of look at their um, practice. Like for example, if it's an artist or if it's a course that you know you want to do, an online course or a course in person, and you know like, oh, this is what I would learn if I've uh, learned, if I've done that course, then um, you kind of outline that briefly in the first I think actually this is the second question so yeah in the in the second question that asks you how you hope to get to get there basically uh, how you will go about it so you would outline that um what you intend to learn from them uh within, within the program that you're designing um so I did that so I had a, a section for like research so I wanted to know more about artists that were musicians and how they wrote songs and things like that. So I had that section. Then I outlined all of the practical things that I wanted to do with all my mentors over that time and explained why uh, it was important for my practice that I did those things within that time frame. So that was kind of how I went about writing the, the second question. And then the third question where it's like, why is this important now? Um, I was really thinking about sustainability. So I was I was really going through a phase where I realized that when you have a body-based practice, it's quite hard to move away from like needing space. Um, so if you're a dancer or you're a theater maker, you need physical space to make work. Whereas if you're able to create music, you might just need uh, equipment and you can do it from home. So that's kind of what really, where I really focused in terms of why now because I wanted to create a practice that is not just reliant on my physical my physicality basically I wanted something that I could then continue even if I didn't have space which is really useful as an artist um, so then that's why I decided that I wanted to learn music vocal uh, learn music voice work and writing as well so that was really helpful for me and then in terms of how it kind of goes into this idea of like future work or how it will impact your practice in the future um, I started to think that learning new skills is helpful obviously because then you can actually teach other people how to do things so you can um, offer workshop yourself once you're confident enough in the, in the form that you're learning you can also collaborate with other people on projects um and the other thing that i really thought was important for me was that i wanted to create a future work coming out of the dycp 
Um, so I decided that even though I'm not naming the work, I know that I wanted to create a piece of work that included music, like soundscaping, um, and as well as my practice that I already had been working on for five years. So I wanted to incorporate all of that into the new work. So it was really important for me to say that actually I, without the CYCP, I cannot develop the way that I want to. Um, so it's just thinking about how to say that right now you're in this you're in this space and then you want to get here how will you get in this how will you then get to the places that you want to be as an artist and as a maker um how how will it impact really the way you develop uh, as an artist and as well how can it help you get when you get to that stage what else can you do uh, when you get to the stage after you've after you've gone through this training and this uh, process I don't know what everyone kind of wants to do, but it could be even if you're whatever development you're doing is just kind of discussing how important is it to your practice now and future practice as well. Um, yeah, so then I've kind of spoken through most of the application itself. I I kept my like expenditure really basic. I literally have four. Um, like it's a table really simple i just said this is how much i'm paying myself this is how much i'm paying this my music um mentor the dramaturg like this is how much i'm paying everyone and then total that so it's really simple um yeah sorry oh i've got a minute okay and then the other thing I wanted to say as well, when you outline the project, um, don't overcomplicate and give loads of information, just give what is really important for people to know. So you really want to make it concise. Um, so just say like, I'm going to do this from this to this, from this period to this period with this person. So really simple is the easiest way. Because I think when there's too much information, it's not as easy to read. So my top tips would be, don't put too much in the application to overwhelm yourself. Um, think realistically, what can I do in a year? A year is not a long time. So just go from, from this period to this period, I can do this amount of learning. And that's what you put in the application. Uh, make it really clear. Uh, when it's clear, it's really easy to read. So they'll get it in, they'll understand what you wanna say. And it's more likely um, that it will be successful. And then, yeah, really think about how it impacts your future practice. So using this, um, this application as a way to go, okay, this is where I want to be later on. It can also really help uh, how you then succeed further. I think that's all I have to say. I hope that was helpful. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> that's great. So moving on, um, if we can have Megan Griffith next, please. Hello, Megan. <laughs> Over to you. Give me one second. Not nothing. Um, okay, I'll try and not be too long winded. <laughs> I've gone through my application and just written notes around it. Um, so I'm a theatre director and um, create like experiential events producer. Um, but I do. I'm a bit of like a jack of all trades, master of none sort of an artist. Um, just for context, I absolutely hate writing applications. I'm like a maximalist person. So I'll always write like 5,000 words when the word limit is 500 words. Um, so I found this really difficult because of its brevity, um, but it is definitely more manageable than the project grants because I have the same problem with those um, as many sort of creative uh, people in their 30s. I'm currently on an ADHD discovery journey. Um, and I think that's why it's difficult. Um, so I had to decide what I wanted to do it on because I actually started the other way around by knowing that I wanted to invest time into my into learning because I've always learned by doing with like looming deadlines and like pressure. So rather than having kind of like the space to actually explore. Um, but with sort of so many different strings in my practice, I had to think about what I wanted to do it on. And actually, um, I think that thing of sometimes your strengths and your weaknesses being the same thing became quite a powerful thought for me. Um, so the idea of like actually doing all these different things 
can be sort of my niche and how to like hone those things into something tangible. So I called my, I said that I wanted to specialize in experiential entertainment and the crux of the bid came up, uh, became about sort of bridging the gap between sort of like the nightlife scene in Manchester and the theater scene um, and sort of creating these experiential events that would be more sustainable having observed an appetite for sort of like performers and stuff in bars and clubs um, but we don't have like big immersive shows like they do in London. Um, a tip I would say is to, and something that helped me identify what I wanted to do it on was um, rereading loads of other bids that I'd written recently. Um, I don't know about anyone else, but I go through in yes phases and no phases. And before this had been in a little no phase for a while, but it meant that I'd written loads. So I could kind of like reread all these ones that I'd written recently and been like, ah, that's something I keep on saying about my practice. Um, so yeah, saying that I'm going to bring together these like theatre directing, experiential events and DJ to, DJing to create narrative nightlife. Um, I was also lucky in that both of my housemates had recently got um, successful ones um, So and like a good friend. So I read three bids by people that I knew all focused on different areas and came to this one of these sessions and read, I think I read two more from like the White Pube or something. Um, and yeah, I think that was really useful in identifying like certain structural things, because as I said, I will like waffle on for ages, but seeing like the clarity of people being like, this will fund me to work for three months, three days a week, and it being like really clear what it is they're funding, I found really helpful um, to like help me hone it. Um, yeah, I think clarity and structure is like a really, really key thing and evidencing how you can self-manage a slow burn project. Um, and thinking also about like what, how, um, as Tamsin was saying, like it's you designing your own university in a way. So do you want to do it like intensively and full time or do you want to do it slow burn with like space for other paid work and like things that come your way? Um, I decided I was going to do mine part time. So mine was to be funded two days a week for five months. Um, yeah, which I think went something along the lines of like, I went for the full 10K uh, and I think on the bid, it's something like six grand to me, um, three grand for other artists. Um, and then like the, the rest of it is like travel material, stuff like that. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I've been to like tons of these sessions over the years. I was definitely someone who just like went to millions of advice sessions and didn't write apps or had rejections or whatever. So I think I've just, um, something that people always talk about is like setting the stakes and telling a story this thing that's already been mentioned of like where are you now um and where where could you be with the help of this um so I my sort of narrative was that I've been making work for like 10 years and I've done loads of stuff um and I've sort of like established who I am in my practice but I've never actually had any mentoring support and I'm like a bit always the bridesmaid never the brides <laughs> like I'll get structured uh, I'll get shortlisted for fellowships but I hadn't had anything and saying like with this time and space um and the connections I've got and the skills I've already developed I think I could really be um a go-to person for this style of work in the north and I kind of made the north a bit of a narrative as I was saying about like I don't think this thing fully exists in the north yet but I think people want it um um yeah knowing who you are and, and what art you're currently making and why you make it already really well so as I was saying recognizing the key themes and the USP uh things that you want to build on or take in a different direction um mine felt a bit funny in that a lot of people at this time I submitted mine last summer like this time last year were thinking about COVID as a framing device and thinking like oh how do we pivot to digital and stuff Whereas mine's kind of the opposite of that. It's sort of saying, let's bring everyone together in a space and create something that you can't experience online. So it felt a little bit like, oh, are they gonna go for this? But the thing that I've been holding on to was like, hopefully people will value that sort of thing even more. Um, yeah, thinking about stuff that genuinely interests you and also might be of interest to them. Um, so something I kind of think about the Arts Council is it's wanting you to be more sustainable and it's kind of wanting this investment in you 
to eventually build you to a place where you won't need their investment because you're so sort of self-sustaining to so something else that I kind of talked about quite a bit was like um, combining like the creative and the commercial as a, and talking about non-theatre venues but not necessarily in a site specific way sort of more like being like I'm going to create eventually I want to create um, immersive dining experiences and clubbing experiences um, and some of that came through observing actually in the wake of lockdowns I felt like I was going to a lot of empty theatres um, but you couldn't get a table at a restaurant and everyone was happy to pay eight pounds for a glass of wine. Um, but in a lot of these sort of bar settings, performers are becoming more common. So sort of being like, actually, people seem to not want to spend money on this at the moment, but people are enjoying it when it's there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was kind of something that I talked about is this, um, yeah, sort of taking art into different spaces, but not in like a patronising way um yeah thinking about like yeah I kind of already spoke spoke about that like what what are your brags and what are your insecurities so how do you say like I've, I've done all of this without any support so far so think of what I could do with the support um and and, and again as I said for me it was like the thing that is my insecurity sometimes this I've done loads of different things but I've never had the chance to specialize became the narrative that I created of like well actually that's meant that my practice is very um octopusy lots of arms and legs and uh with this investment I'm going to use that to specialize and be a go-to person um identifying a need and responding to it is something that people always talk about in these funding bid workshops being like why does because this is public money essentially it's like why does society need this work from you um, and I think, yeah, me saying that that sort of like you can't get this sort of stuff in the north, this immersive experience things in the way that I'd like to create it. Um, bringing in support. Oh, yeah. Using numbers and figures to prove your clout. So that's something I've started doing in the last year or so is about being like, I have been making work for a decade. I have directed 40 productions. Um, my collective attracted this many audiences over the past year without any funding um just like numbers to say like again like yeah what have you done so far and by yourself um but again I think I think Tansen said this but being careful to make it not seem like you don't need it like say like why why and so I said my part of mine was saying I'm working like project to project so there's never any time for creative development I'm just always going like back to back with projects and having to learn by doing which always feels very like high risk um and like burnouty and feeling a bit like I'm stuck at a certain level um bringing in support so as I said I'm extremely long-winded so mine was like I was really happy with like the concept I put together but it was about like three times too long even on like three days before the deadline <laughs> So um, I actually brought in my friend Hannah, who's a producer, um, and she's like written loads of bids and I paid her for a day to go through it with me um, and help sort of like hone it down to make it like, just like lose some words and make it clearer. Um, being a control freak, I then like rewrit it again myself, but it was really instrumental for me as a, um, as a neurodiverse person, helping, having her to help me streamline it. Um, yeah you break breaking it down into sections um so mine were theater spaces utilizing tech creative nightlife and using music to tell stories sorry non-theater spaces using music to tell stories and then i kind of had an, an extra section which was film lighting and music and saying these are things that always feature in my ideas and in my work in quite an ad hoc way and i want to like raise the stakes of that um already spoke about cross-sector working and future-proofing your practice um yeah putting I put a mentor on mine um for me it was about someone who'd made work in different settings um and to help me sort of like guide the journey um I, th I think especially if you don't have any producing experience it might be useful to have someone who's like a producer um who can like keep help you keep on top of it um yeah utilizing everything you can the letter of support and the evidence um of your work making sure it all relates to the app um i 
maybe this is annoying to say I was a last minute asker sorry <laughs> but what I did actually because I knew I was being a pain in the neck by asking last minute I actually had two two different ones from different projects from different people within the same organization and I combined them sent it to a trusted person and said is this okay can you sign off on this so I think it's probably not advised practice but sometimes being cheeky and saving someone some time is useful um Megan can I get you to wrap up now please yeah of course uh let me just see what the most relevant last thing is yeah I think um recognizing that it is because it's over a long period of time and as we know things being freelance artists things can like move and change even in the time that you're waiting for the response from the Arts Council. So creating um, a project that you really believe in, you'll really benefit from with like partners that you've got relationships with, but also knowing that context can shift. Um, people might say yes to things, you might say yes to things that can change that timeline. Uh, and also you might develop new relationships that actually serve the project better. So making sure it is something you can get behind and feels accurate, but also not feeling like totally wedded to it. Um, because like, for example, I landed loads of work while I was waiting for my yes. So I'm actually only really, I've done bits of it, but I'm only really getting to grips with mine now. Um, so knowing that you do have that bit of wiggle room and not being like too scared to uh, propose stuff. Um, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. That was great. So if we can move on to our final speaker, uh, Kelly Munro Fawcett, please. Hi, guys. Thanks very much uh, for letting me talk about DYCC. Um, yeah, I'm Kelly. I'm an actor and um, I'm co-artistic director at Red Bubble Arts, which is a theatre company. Um, my uh, application came from a period in lockdown, which was like, a lot of reflection. Um, I'm a single parent, so no income stream. Um, and I'd recently had an ADHD diagnosis um, at like my mid thirties, which was quite a surprise. Um, and I was interested in um, empowerment for women because of the journey that I'd been on myself. So um, I ended up applying for a project, which was um, an amalgamation of the skills that I've had in the past, which was theatre making, being an actor, um, I'm a community engagement worker or um, specialist, I suppose. And then I work um, in wellbeing and education um, in, with creative workshopping. So basically, um, I put a bid in for um, a period to design, to research and design a creative workshop series to help empower women with ADHD in both community settings and also uh, women in the arts because there's a lot of us who are undiagnosed or recently diagnosed or thinking hold on a minute perhaps I am uh, neurodiverse so I think how I put the bid together I'll just talk through that um I think it was um, basically about looking at my skill set, looking at the gaps, what was missing, what I wanted to learn about or know about. And for me, the driving force was um, not having any income because Red Bubble Arts didn't receive funding for two years. So that was a, that was a primary driver. It literally was crap. I need to adapt quickly. Um, so that's where I sort of spent a period of time looking, I spent a lot of time actually, really sort of thinking over what could I do, and I'd really encourage that sort of reflection period, I wouldn't rush a bid in any way, you know, don't be afraid to take a few months to sort of like work out what it is that you really want to invest in. Um, so yeah, so for me the priority was really to invest in a professional development period, so I could design a brand new income stream for future sustainability as an artist so that I had an extra stream of income, which would help me uh, in times when we don't get project grants or I haven't got any acting work. So that's where it came from. So I think, um, yeah, so it was like reflection, looking at the skills, looking at the gaps, time, taking time, um, and then suddenly landing on an idea 
but then not really knowing how I was going to put this together. So for me, um, I just swear by this. Um, I mind map my projects. So there's this really great um, website called MindMeister, which I would encourage people to use. It's free. Um, and you can literally, it's great as well if you're neurodiverse, you just literally dump all of your ideas in a mind map. Um, and then you can start to sort of revisit that and go like, what is this? Like, where is it coming from? Like, where am I going to head? Um, so yeah, and that mind mapping process allowed me over like a few weeks or months to sort of pull out areas like access, for example, became really important. I needed, I needed coaching. I needed like ADHD coaching to be able to get me through a DYCP um, on my own, solo. Um, so that was really important. Um, yeah, and then I landed on the idea. And I think um, how I wrote the bid was sort of tied up in how I put it together. So yeah, the, the mind mapping, um, the time, the space, um, really thinking about SMART goals which we've mentioned earlier, but like, I can't even stress those enough, like smart, measurable, achieve, what is it? Yeah, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and targeted or time. I always think of it as like a time scale. So like mapping out the timing. So really looking at those areas. I know it's pretty boring, but you've got to start with the end in mind. Like if you don't start with the end in mind of what you want to he head for, you can't do smart work. That makes sense. So for me, I know I wanted to end with a designed workshop series and then I worked backwards from that point and that then allowed me to sort of think right I need partners I need partners who can support me so I partnered with people like academics who could give me some information like psychologists psychiatrists um, I partnered with Mind Mental Health Charity partnered with uh, a company a kickstart company like a startup who were doing really well who were featured on Apple and they had a new neurodivergent staff for the women, women led. Um, I partnered with, yeah, theatre people. So I kind of like partnered and I was like, right, what else do I need? Okay, I need research periods. So I need to be like writing in my bid, like podcasting and books to read. And yeah, basically it was just amazing to get all that time to literally research. So my mind was very research heavy. It was literally like four months of research followed by two months of design. Um, so yeah, start at the end, work backwards, start with the end in mind. Um, how I wrote it as well was I set goals. I'm such a geek, sorry. I just set like monthly goals. So I, I wrote it over Christmas. So sorry, I had the idea over Christmas. So December, I was like, right, I'm going to form the idea like smart goal wise. And then like in January, I'm going to literally mind map the hell out of it. So I know every little area. And then in February, I wrote it and I gave myself four weeks to write it because I am ADHD. I do get really distracted. I get a lot of resistance and procrastination. So I thought little and often, so like chunk and check, chunk and check. I'd write a chunk, go away, come back to it. And that really worked. Um, I didn't actually get anyone to check mine because I think because I'd never written our bids like Lou, our partner at Red Bubble. She's amazing at bid writing. So I was like, I'm just going to do this and throw this. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And if it does, brilliant. So that's what I did. Sorry, my battery's about to go. Just give me one sec. <laughs> Hold on. There we go. Yeah, um, so yeah, breaking it down into chunks. Um, and then like easy read. I cannot stress easy read format enough. Um, really simple, just like literally simple. Um, and in fact, when I was writing my bid, because I gave myself that time to write it, I had the most amazing breakthrough. I realized about two weeks into writing that I'd gone way, I'd made it too big because like, I'm a big picture person and I just went huge. And I was talking about like female empowerment and like, oh my God, how can I do that? I can't do that. I can do one specific area and that's what I'm going to do. So I literally just deleted everything I'd written. But by giving myself that time, I had room to adapt and maneuver and then really hone down like targeted. And I just thought I'm going to do this tiny area and let's see if it sticks. Um, I think, da, 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 was it? yeah, so I think it was successful. These are the reasons I think it was successful. The simplicity of it, 
and I was really honest like I can't even tell you how honest I was I was literally like I'm a single mum I've had a long-term health condition for two years I've got no income stream these are my skill set I'm going to go away I'm going to reflect on this and I'm going to pull together this program of work which amalgamates my skills and I'm hoping that over a five-year period I'm going to create a new income stream for myself which supports me as an artist I literally like I was so honest and I thought oh my god is this too much information for the arts council they don't want to know if I'm a single parent and I've had like this long-term health condition but actually I think that was I think that was fundable because it came from a place of honesty um I think that the space the time to breathe letting the idea breathe letting the idea shrink down into really what are you passionate about like there's no point in just putting a bid in because you just want the money because you're going to get bored and you won't really create anything of like longevity so yeah something that you're passionate about something that inspires you and fires you up you know because if it fires you up when they read it they're going to get excited as well I think yeah and like looking for the gaps look for the gaps like look at your skills you've got and identify a gap and which bit do you really want to work on and I think that for me was was why it was successful um yeah simplicity honesty uh being yeah being like giving yourself time space and goals like break it down don't feel like you've just got to get a bid in because the deadline's come in I don't know for example it might be that it it took me about six months really from the first thought of I'm going to put a bid in to the end result of submitting for about six months and I'm glad and one thing that I, my reflection is how I could have improved my process of DYCP is give myself more time I wish I'd put in for a year and I put in for six months so I actually ended up having to extend my bid because I got COVID um so that's a learning curve so I'd say take your time <laughs> be honest simple and something that fires you up is more likely to get funded yeah thank you that was great thanks for that that's it brilliant thank you so um we can move on now thank you all three of you if you'd like to stick around and if you've got anything to chip into the to questions and things please do um so yes if we move on to sort of q and q and a section now how are we doing for questions davinia um, we've got a couple that came in on the break, so we can just go through those. I think it'll be fairly quick to answer. Um, so the first one is, uh, what do you attach to show your work if you haven't, uh, if you don't have a lot of your work documented and you haven't done a lot of professional work and you don't have a website? That's a bit of an un unanswerable question, except maybe, you know, try and create some materials and, um, and maybe create a website that that does does allow you to write about the practice that you've done and find any photos or whatever i mean this is about this isn't just a a question of you know oh i've got to have showy stuff this is really about demonstrating to arts council that you are worthwhile investing in so you're going to have to get a bit creative with it has anybody else got any suggestions you can do like script sections of scripts and stuff like that can't you so I think it doesn't necessarily have to be like forward facing examples of your work like reviews and photos I think it can be like your literal work like drawings and bits of script and stuff like that I don't know if that's helpful or not yeah I think it is always as Tamsin says I think anything that you're doing do try to have some form of documentation because um that people are going to be asking for that even so once you've actually gone through a process and uh yeah you want a further life for the project there needs to be some evidence of it but, um uh question two um can you use the same supporting document that was used in the previous application i assume that means previous dyc application i mean i would say you can but if it was a previously unsuccessful DYCP application you might want to look to improve it because it's hard to know why things weren't successful but you can always make things better anybody else got any input there yeah, yeah. I think it depends. Go on. um 
Right. Yeah, I was going to say, one, you probably already know about this, but one platform that I used for my supporting document was Canva, because you can make it look really good, even though I'm terrible at tech. So <laughs> I think that, you know, like reformatting it sometimes, give it that really professional shine can go a long way, even if you haven't got much content to put on it. Thanks, Kelly. Could you do me a favour? Could you drop a link to that and to MindMeister in, into the chat, please? Thank you. Um, Sorry, the next question is, is there any guidance on the proportion of the budget that can be used to pay yourself, um, i.e. for time spent on activities? So I know Megan touched on this slightly. Um, I, I don't think there's official guidance and I found that hard as well to think about because um, previously when I've written um, project grants, um, it's been about one of the things they like is like paying as many different artists as possible. But this one, um, having spoken to a lot of people, is really about your development. So I think they want to see like most of the money going to you. Um, I think it is totally appropriate to pay yourself. Um, and I know just something that made me feel empowered with it. I'm someone who I know got a successful bid. Theirs was pretty much like £9,000 to them, £1,000 overheads and like a mentor. It was literally just paying them to not just that sounds um, belittling but it was paying them to like research watch films read plays um, stuff like that um, rather than yeah um, sharing it around loads of people so I think yeah pay yourself properly would be my advice I don't know if other people have different views or experiences to, to confirm there is no formal guidance it might be worth knowing just as a stat um that half of grantees use the funding to forego the need to work so that they could focus on development so they are evidently expecting a large proportion of money to go to you and um, the final question that came through that i recorded was if you have recently had a successful project grant um can you also then apply for dycp yes <laughs> <laughs> you can you can have what you can't do is have an application for dycp and an application for an for a project grant in open at arts council at the same time you can only have one at a time you can have um a, a project grant still running when you apply for dycp you might want to, within your DYCP, make a strong case for how it is that you can manage both at once, because it might speak to the viability of the second project if they're run, both running at the same time. Um, those were the questions that I'd taken a note of um, from our chat. So I don't know if anybody else has any. I, don't know. I think Megan had something to add just then. Yeah, I was just going to say, because I know Tamsin was talking about um, trying to make sure you're not just accidentally putting in a project grant, um, but also thinking, like, I think it's also good to think about, like, the narrative of your career and how, like, other project grants you go for in the future will benefit from your DYCP. So I got my DYCP in November, and as I said, I've had to delay it, but I got a um successful project grant recently and in the project grant i basically talk about how i'm going to be like using the learning from my dycp to build this r d so it's kind of like it's all feeding into each other um so i think it's like making sure that each one has its own identity and is serving its own purpose but i think if you think about your profile something that um I've had a bit of mentoring from talks about thinking about your profile to the Arts Council and what they've received applications from, what they've funded, and like who you are in their eyes, and making sure that all like talks to each other a bit. Thanks, Megan. John's just stuck his hand up. I think that was to say, any more questions, stick your digital or your real hand up. It, it was. It was also to say, I think Holly um, put uh, a comment in the chat um, without putting question first, but I think it is valid. Person in mind for me supporting, person in mind for my supporting document, I also want to use for my mentor if the application is successful. Is that allowed? I don't think there are any rules to stop you, but it might not be that advisable because it might look like a conflict of interest. What I might do is maybe both get a second person to write write your reference letter and put two in on one document just so that you've got a bit of balance maybe 
Great. Yeah. John, did you have something else? Was it the um, final question? Lydia, yeah, Lydia's just put a final question in the chat as well. Um, can you apply for DCP if you're a company rather than an individual? Um, no, <laughs> is the short answer to that. You could only individuals or groups of, if you're a group of individuals that work, to, that collaborate together, um, then one person can put in a, a DYCP for you as a collaboration, but as an organization or a company formally, you cannot apply. Is that it? I think so. Okay. Um, well, thanks for all coming. What I might do, since we've got a few minutes left, because I'm a bit anoraki, um, if anyone wants to leave, this is a bit anoraki, but ACE have commissioned a um, an evaluation of DYCP, which they published in June, and I thought it might be worth, I only read it late last night, so, God, that's sad, um, so I thought a quick summary of the findings might be informative, and this is a very, very quick summary, um, it's five minutes of a long document. Um, DYCP has supported over 4,000 4, practitioners since 2018, um, which is an investment of 36 and a half million. To deal with the increase in demand of the pandemic, the pot was increased to 14.4 million for 22-23. The success rate for applicants from diverse backgrounds is strong, with 25% global majority, 53% female identifying and 18% disabled identifying. It is seen to offer a unique opportunity for freelance practitioners. It's seen as a contribution to freelancers. Um, most grantees agree that the, the funding had enabled a step change or accelerated their career. The OICP delivers mainly against Let's Create Country via greater innovation, development of talent, increased collaboration, access to international opportunities, more sustainable and resilient careers, supporting diversity in the workforce and supporting progression into leadership roles. Visual arts and music receive most applications and have some of the lowest success rates as a result. Museums and libraries receive few applications with relatively high success rates. Combined arts is also quite low. London receives the most, DYCP supports a disproportionate number in the Midlands and North compared to the workforce. And the proportion in the priority places is supporting the government's leveling up agenda. Motivations included a desire for autonomy, to explore new creative and cultural practice, to progress or change career, to develop new and existing relationships, to purchase equipment for development, to invest time research into developing projects, knowledge and skills, to adapt to challenges posed by the pandemic and or reduce reliance on grant funding. The process of writing the application was seen as formative, as an impetus or catalyst to identify a vision, to find a set of objectives and deliverables and think about the actions needed to achieve it. It was particularly formative for those less experienced in applying for funding who developed application writing skills. Most projects received between seven and a half and 10,000 pounds. Applications for larger levels of funding were more likely to be successful, suggesting that the scale of activities stroke ambition may be a factor in the likelihood of success. The most common focus was R&D, least common was international travel, probably because of the pandemic. Very high proportions undertook research, developed existing skills or new skills, and worked with new or existing collaborators and mentors. Considerable proportions accessed training or residencies or advice, or funded workspace, studio time or equipment. Around one fifth worked with communities. The UICP allowed flexibility with plans. 53% of respondents reported some change of plan activities wise. Half of grantees used the funding to forego the need to work to focus on development. Impacts experienced ranged from self-belief to new skills, new and higher quality work, 
new relationships, better profile, and securing work opportunities and leadership roles, plus increased enthusiasm and confidence and the feeling of validation. Grantees reported recognising the value of development time, feeling more willing to invest in themselves, take risks, reach out to contacts, and take on bigger challenges. They felt that the quality of their work had improved, they'd improved recognition, visibility and reach, both within their sector and with audiences. They were better equipped to sustain opportunities, both new and existing. They were better able to sustain a career in their sector. They were better able to commit time and not worry about other commitments was key to the value added by DYCP funding. In many cases, there had already been a public benefit, while others expected this in the future. Some grantees talked about teaching acquired, teaching acquired skills to others. Some projects influenced the role grantees wanted to play in their sector, including taking on leadership roles to pay it forward. Confidence, networks, knowledge and skills were particularly important to this. Some thought that their next steps should be about commercialising their practice and reducing dependency on funding. Others that their next steps required additional funding. Fewer successful applicants had applied for funding elsewhere since DYCP, but those who had were more likely to have secured it than unsuccessful DYCP applicants. So yeah, those were the kind of summaries that I found, which I thought gave maybe a few insights into where, where it was sitting with ACE and what had or hadn't been successful. So I just thought it was worth wrapping up with that. If nobody has any more questions, then I think we should, we should call this um, to a close. And thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. I think Tamsin, Megan just asked a question about what you were talking about. Oh, just is that, does that exist online anywhere? It was great. Yes, there's, um, I haven't got the link to hand, but the um, there is a whole section within the DLICP bit about their evaluation. And that was from the, I haven't read the full length version. That's from the consultants short version um, and the Arts Council's response to it. And I've, I've kind of messed around to compile it into something that made sense, but there's more detail there. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got two more questions. Oh, uh, Adrian uh, had the hand up. Adrian, would you like to ask your question? Sorry, I was. I thought I was applauding. I didn't mean to put. My oh, hand up. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> no problem. Um, and then the other one is: Are there any similar meetings for project grants coming up? Um, We've not planned um, and to do another one for project grants, but the one we did in April is online in our YouTube, which John's just put back into the chat. So the full session is is on YouTube to watch at your leisure, and it's long. Yeah. And how long will this be recording be online for? Until it, um, uh, when I managed to download it off, off um, out of the cloud and, and then re-upload it to YouTube. So uh, stay next week. Yeah, I've put that in the chat as a message within a week or so. <laughs> and I've put where? <clears throat> Great, no more questions. Brilliant. Well, thank you all. Good luck with it. If, if speakers etc want to stay in the room for a little bit we can have a quick debrief thank you thank you, you so much bye, bye. thank you everyone thank you